20% discount off of that. So uh, hopefully a few of you will see you all in Vegas. Um, anyway, that's enough of me. Here is Mr. Ivo Terra. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning. Monday. Ugh. Good news about Monday is you're here, you're not at work. So, although if you're here, that means you're not at work. You have more work to do when you get back home or to work. So, unfortunate thing. So it's Monday morning, which is always a fun time to do a keynote talk. Thanks for showing up and being here for it and the last day. Hopefully we have some, some additional fun here. Um, this was me about 18 or so months ago, and I was in a very similar place to where many of you are today. And if you'll indulge me a moment, I want to talk to me about that guy and the guy that I am today. It'll be a little different talk than the rest of the things you've heard about where they've given you things you can go back and implement right away. I'm going to be talking about ideas and thoughts and things to think about for the scary thing called the future. So let's see how fun this is. I got my start on the web in 1994, where I managed to convince a vice president that I was the smartest guy in the company when it came to the internet. And I wasn't lying, because it was 1994. <laughs> I had mastered the blink tag. And uh, that was, started my career in this crazy thing. Of course, I went on beyond that, put together a large team of designers and developers that built, before the calendar changed, uh, an e-commerce platform online that was the first ever in its vertical and stayed that way for like two or three years. It was great, it was fun, it was an interesting thing to do, but it was, in all honesty, kind of boring. I got thrust into the advertising world when the CEO of my company uh, called me into his office and gave me an hour-long ass-chewing for not spending the money allocated to, on to advertising. My department had a budget for advertising. I learned right then that there was this thing called online advertising. I had no idea that we could do this one, and I wasn't too terribly excited about it until he told me I had half a million dollars to spend. Ooh, half a million dollars. So it was very early in the game. Your options at that time were either to find a gigantic advertising agency that had two people working in this new online space, or what I did is I found a boutique agency that had just started up, and that's all they did was online advertising. Gave them a small amount of money, worked really, really well, so we started funneling more and more cash into it. In fact, it worked so well that after two years, I quit my job and went to work as a VP and managing director for that boutique agency because online advertising was cool. Building e-commerce platforms was not. It's about this same time that I recognized there was more to the internet than just online advertising, that there was this whole new cool thing in the early 2000s called new media that was happening. So I got involved through online radio, which turned into podcasting, won some awards, wrote some books, played in this space for a long time, wound up going and talking to large organizations of people exactly unlike you, people who didn't get it, like realtors and other sorts of crazy people, getting up on stage telling them how they could take advantage of this new digital medium. I called myself a digital strategist, hung out on my shingle, and was paid handsomely from lots of different companies or organizations to basically tell them what not to do on the internet. And that was a pretty fun ride. I might have been a little arrogant at the time. In, um, and then a little something I like to call 2008 happened. Everything sucked in 2008. Um, clients dried up, people were changing, people were moving. It was not, not a great time. So I wound up kind of pushing one thing off to the side and then joining the agency ranks again because the agencies would still work, this time not as a boutique agency, which had tanked, but actually as a very large agency. Well, at least a very large agency in the, in the second tier city where, where I used to live, Phoenix, Arizona. Pretty big company, a full service digital agency. Uh, I wound up being in charge of the teams that took care of all the pay-per-click ads, all of the display advertising. Uh, we put together the digital strategies and campaigns for our clients. We did content marketing. I had a big enterprise SEO team um, and even in the social media stuff. Basically, if it wasn't design and it wasn't development, it was what my team was actually doing. And I spent about five years doing that. So back once again in the agency life. And so by 2014, 20 years had elapsed since I first got on the web professionally. 20 years. And I thought two things. One, holy shit, 20 years. 
But I also looked back and saw that over time things had been changing. The internet that we had is not the internet of today. And of course that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's digital marketing. It's digital advertising. The web constantly changes, right? That's the normal change that we see. But I noticed some fundamentally different things happening that had been happening for the years, the years prior to that that all came to a head to me last year. One, and Marcus, our first speaker um, of the conference, talked about this. One was that Google really wasn't a search engine anymore. I mean, yes, you can go to Google.com, and clearly it's a search engine. But the company that is Google made $17.3 billion in revenue last quarter. $17.3 billion. You don't need $17.3 billion of revenue to run a fucking search engine. $17.3 billion lets you do things way beyond a simple search engine. The $17.3 billion is simply the means to an end, or in Google's case, several different ends. Like this. No surprise, in this audience, I'm sure everybody here knows that Google's working on automated, self-driving cars. Three days ago, they announced that this summer, like, what is this summer? In a couple of days, you know, a couple of months? They will actually have self-driving cars on the road in Mountain View, California. Yeah, for the handful of streets where these things can actually drive. But they're moving out of the testing mode. And they're moving into the beta mode where they actually put them on the streets and will be driving around, cars driving themselves. And that's weird. But they're doing it because they have $17.3 billion and they can figure out how to do that. But they've set their sights a little higher. Get it? higher than just self-driving cars. Google is actively working on building, and I am not kidding, a space elevator. Now, the, the project is currently on hold, not because the science doesn't work, it does. The, the engineering works, the physics works. Everything works except for one tiny piece, it's actually a big piece. They need material sciences to catch up so they can build a cable that's 23,000 miles long to go to outer space. But it will work, and it will happen. It will probably happen, definitely not this year. It's not a hold for that one. But it will likely happen before many of us leave the planet, which would be really stinking cool. And if you stop and think for a minute, there's a search engine. It's going to build a space elevator. <laughs> but the project Google is working on that I am most excited about, so that perhaps I can see the space elevator being built, is they're actively working to cheat death. It's a Google X project right now that is actively trying to extend life. And not just the shitty end of years, end of life years, right? So not trying to make you 120 that makes you feel like you were only 93. No, no. They're not trying to do that. They're trying to really slow down the aging process so that we can live longer. Because when you make $17.3 billion, you can pay your executives big fat paychecks. Why not give them a few more years to live, right? Same thing goes for us. Well, hopefully it goes for us. Hurry up, Google, because <clears throat> I'm not getting any younger up here. It's not just Google that's making these gigantic moves. PayPal, who did the most trivial and also most awesome thing, allow us to pay each other via email. Crazy. Easy. PayPal is definitely revolutionizing the way the financial marketplaces are going to work in the future, not just for personal person-to-person -person payments, but also lots of other things they have their money into. But that's not what excites me the most about PayPal's money. The most exciting thing is what's happened with the money that PayPal has generated for just one guy. And that one guy has taken the money out of PayPal and has created not just an electric car, an electric car that works, but an electric car that has become the symbol of status and achievement, at least from the other side of the pond where I'm at. It's not about a Rolex watch anymore. It's not about necessarily having a Rolls in your driveway. It's all that you probably have one of those two. But it is pulling up in your Tesla Model S, which is a giant to all of your friends who don't have one. <laughs> that same guy is using his money to say, I am sick to, and tired of listening to all of the bullshit surrounding solar energy, and I'm just going to do it myself. I'm not going to worry about regulations. I'm not going to worry about government grants. I'm just going to launch a company that's going to put solar panels on the roofs all over the goddamn world, and I'm going to win. He's not waiting for it. He's doing it, and it's coming out of the money made 
from us sending money via email back and forth to each other. Fascinating. Now, I'm not so sure that Elon Musk is a crazy person. I think, really, he wants to be Captain Kirk. Oh, sorry, I'm in London, Jean-Luc Picard. So, for those Star Trek Gex fans. He wants to do this desperately. His problem is, however, he doesn't have a federation of planets on his side, so he's just going to have to build one himself because Elon really, really does want to retire on Mars. Sounds crazy, but he does. And I would love for him to take him with me, but that's probably not going to happen. But it's not just PayPal and Google, it's also Amazon, biggest marketplace on the planet, Amazon.com, dominates. I'm sure many of you play with and play against Amazon in your daily lives. We love them, we hate them, but they are there. Here's the funny thing. They don't make any money, at least not any profits. Amazon.com lost $57 million last quarter. And you know what's really weird? No one gives a shit. No one cares. Stock prices, fine. Investors, throwing money at it. No one cares that Amazon.com, the largest marketplace on the planet, doesn't make a profit. This bald-headed guy in the back, he doesn't care because he's busy worried about his next project, which is building a shipping company to outer space. These guys are fascinated by space. There's something to that one. Jeff really doesn't care that his company doesn't make money because it doesn't have to make money. It makes him enough money and that the investments are in there so that he can fund outstanding things like Blue Origin. We don't hear a lot about them, not as, fat, as, not as flashy as SpaceX, but they're doing it. They had a little test launch about a week ago that was awesome. Amazon.com is going to space and it's not to deliver books. It's not what they're doing there. And the final trend that I noticed there's a huge amount of money being poured into the concept of startups. Everything we just talked about before is, is a kind of startup. But lots and lots of money being poured into startups, specifically around the education of startups. A whole new breed of companies called accelerators and incubators over the last few years have cropped up to bring in piles and piles and piles, literally, of money into brand new ideas that people are able to put into action and make it go forward. And the most amazing thing about this is that the top school for a startup is called Y Combinator. If you've got a startup and you can get into Y Combinator, you have made it. The greatest chance of you being the next big billion dollar company is in Y Combinator. Three month program. The interesting thing is, and you'll be told this, and you can ask anybody that one, is that graduates of Y Combinator have a 90% chance of failure. So imagine for a moment that your postgraduate son or daughter comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, I want to go to medical school. It's going to cost you $50,000 to put me through medical school. And there's a 90% chance that when I graduate, I won't be a doctor. We wouldn't do that. Yet all of the companies that are sitting in Y Combinator do that. So the future looks pretty weird, especially from the startup space. It's a different model where there's a different expectation of what money is supposed to do. It's just not quite the same thing that it used to be. And the future is very, very difficult to predict. Yes, yes, very, very true. But obviously, there's something happening in startups. And it's not my first go around. I've had five different startups. Three of them were in the media space. Uh, no, I'm sorry, three of them were in the publishing space, two were, or one was in media, and the other in the financial services. So I played in the startup game, but it's a different game that's out there today. And that new game isn't about how quickly can you make money. The new game is about hyper growth. In Y Combinator, the success metric is really, really simple. It's, it's kind of complicated, but we can simplify it down to this. If your new startup is able to grow something, active users, new registrations, downloads, revenue, I suppose, if you want to. Typically, they don't do that one. If you're able to grow that number that is critical to your business's success, grow that number 10% month over month. That's all they're looking for. It sounds like a very achievable goal, 10% growth, simple enough to do. Um, do the math out for 12 months. I'll do it quickly for you. That means your company is three times as big as it was after 12 months, and after two years, you're at 10x which is a magic number that starts getting VC investors interested so they can make lots of money back on you. That's really all you have to do to be considered as a success. Keep in mind, though, that even though successes, 90% of them fail, which is hard to wrap your head around. But that's the way that it looks. So armed with that information, 
and my growing frustration with working in an advertising agency again, I, the, I was the VP of Media and Innovation at the time, along with the president of the agency and the CFO of the agency, we decided to do something else. We decided to launch a new startup that was going to be focused on startups. Hey, we're in Phoenix, Arizona. We can't try and become the next Y Combinator. And we don't want to become the next Y Combinator because we didn't like that 90% failure rate. There were some things that we wanted to do differently, but yes, we wanted to accelerate, accelerate and incubate some of these new startups that were happening in our individual town. So that's what we did. But we were doing um, a few things differently. We had really two unique selling propositions, if you will, for, for our business. And they're both relevant to the conversation of, of, this, of, of you people. The one thing we were looking for is we wanted to look for disruptive startups. Most accelerators and incubators were focused in on certain verticals, like ad tech, or biomedical, or manufacturing. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to think broader about it, but, we, but also narrower in the fact that we needed companies working. We wanted to work with companies that were trying to disrupt their industry that they live in. And disruption can mean a lot of different things. It's a big buzzword today, and I don't mean it from the buzzy perspective, so I'm going to define disruption through these three tenets of, of disruption that are up here. Number one, a disruptive startup has to be going after a stable, existing marketplace. A lot of the failures we were seeing from the big startup world of YC Combinators were companies that were trying to do something brand spanking new that had never been done before. That's great. It can grow you gigantic, but you can also lose pretty quickly. Or as we say, there's no point in trying to disrupt the space elevator industry yet. Material science catches up. We'll see how that goes. The second thing was we were looking for, we wanted to work with companies who were focused not on everybody, which is what big Y Combinator startups do, but focus just on the underserved minority. And let me explain what I mean by that. In 2006, the gaming console market was dominated by two major players, PlayStation and Xbox. And they were involved in what I call the war of more. Every time a new version came out, it had a faster Processor, had a better graphics card. They launched more games on their platform than the other. A, matter, a game of one-upsmanship between these two colossal giants. So Nintendo had been out of the console game market for a while. I mean, let's face it, N64 couldn't play with those level guys. So they dropped the Wii in the middle of this maelstrom of craziness happening at PC gaming in 2006. And when the Wii came out, it was universally panned in every single gaming magazine and publication as a going, going to be a dismal failure and a flop. Why? Terribly underpowered. Kind of crappy graphics card. And in relation to the other two powerhouses, handful of games. No one, no serious gamer, is going to buy this console box. And you know what? They were right. And Nintendo wasn't going after the serious gamer who was the majority. They were going after the minority. They were going after people who didn't want to do this, who thought this seemed like a cool thing to do, who had small children at home who wanted to actually play games with those small children because those small children could kick the shit out of them when it came to doing this. I know I couldn't keep up with my kid doing it. So that's what Nintendo is going after, the underserved market. And the third tenet is, is scale. And I'll use Nintendo as an example again. Two years later, we were outselling Xbox and PlayStation combined. They scaled in a big way. So that's who we were looking for with this new company we had launched in 2014. Not necessarily the next biggest Nintendo that was out there, although that would have been cool. But that leads us to our second unique selling proposition is we were going after the long tail. Because for every startup that managed to raise a million, 10 million in their VC rounds, there were hundreds if not thousands, and in Phoenix definitely dozens of new companies starting up all the time that were doing it either by bootstrapping, or doing a much smaller initial friends and family raise, or maybe uh, just getting an angel to get pretty excited about their product. And there were loads of these, and nobody was paying attention to them because everybody wanted the big, big win, which is what the VCs wanted, the big win, betting on that 90% fail, 10% success rate. We didn't want to do that. And so that's who we were going after. So we launched a company to do that, and promptly, six months later, bad things happened. I had quit my job. The other two were still at the agency, but I had made the full transition, working with companies every single day, 
having a great time doing it. And then we found out um, that my wife Sheila, who's up front here in the class today, got a, note, a news from her doctor that said, unequivocally, without any doubt, you must leave Phoenix. Not quite killing her, but it was definitely lowering the overall quality of life. So that new thing that I put all my heart and passion and soul into, we had to leave. Because my partners weren't going to leave Phoenix, I had to leave Phoenix. That kind of sucks. After six weeks of, or six months of doing something fun and interesting. But no worries, I'm a pretty adaptable person, so we'll have to do this. And here's where the story gets interesting. Because we were starting to scope out where the next place was. That wasn't Phoenix. And so we started looking. Visiting various cities, seeing who had interesting things to offer, making phone calls. I have connections all over the, all over the states. And in every single conversation I had with somebody went along the, the lines of this town, whatever this town is, from Omaha, Nebraska to Austin, Texas, is perfect for you. Get here. I'll make the introductions. You'll be on your feet. Fantastic. Every single phone call my wife had, she's an instructional designer and a college professor, went pretty much the exact same way. You've got the skills we need. Move here. So we're ready to do that. But then we realized, look, there's another option. You know, life handed us those lemons of the medical diagnosis that get the hell out of Phoenix. What if we took this opportunity to do something different? If there are that many people who are saying, you got it, come on, we'll get you when you get here. If there are that many people out there for that, and the skills that we have aren't in danger of going away anytime real soon, advertising, executive, digital strategy, not going to change a huge amount, Instructional design, education, not going to change a huge amount. What if we took a year off? What if we took a year-long sabbatical and just went away? And so we decided to do that and walk away and just take off a year and do our thing. But I had a big challenge with that. The big challenge is that um, unlike the other billionaires you saw up here, um, I was not amongst their ranks. I didn't have multiple homes I could turn around and sell. I didn't have a giant stock portfolio that I could liquidate. I didn't really have any of that stuff because for as much money as I made, I'm really good at spending it too. So I wasn't in a situation that some of the people that, I, that my colleagues were to where it was easy for them just to go away and put everything on hold for a while. We couldn't do that. We would have to do something quite, quite different. And so for us, it meant quite literally selling everything. This is a photo taken about three days after we made the decision to move and told the world about it as we started selling off all of our possessions. Of course, the first thing to go was the couch, the dining room table, and the beds. So we sat on the floor for six weeks waiting for the rest of this stuff to happen. And then finally, uh, on January, this, this all happened in November. On January the 16th, we packed our bags. Those were the exact bags that I packed, at least. And we had a one-way ticket to go to a little town called Corlay, France. Anyone know where the hell Corlay, France is in the room? One. Excellent. Not surprising. Uh, do not put it on your vacation destination must-haves for 2016. Lovely place. Don't get me wrong, as long as you like farming. Um, that's where we were going, and we didn't really know what else was going to do. The only thing that I knew was I probably wasn't going to not get to Mars anytime soon, and France was as close as I could get. Uh, and my Tesla Model S would have to wait for a couple of years while we tried this new big grand adventure. So the plan was to take a year off. That lasted exactly zero days. Because right before I left, the partners that I've been working with with the firm that I was forced to leave said, could you keep doing some work for us, please? You were so good at doing all of the branding and all the communication for everything. Could you just keep doing that part of your job? We'll pay you significantly less than we were paying you before. Smart people, marketers. Um, but that way we have a little bit of an income stream. And so I said, sure, I'll do that one. So I, I kept the, the communications going uh, for the company. And it took just a couple of weeks before people that had found out that I was moving were like, oh my god, you, you're no longer with that company anymore? No? Great. Um, so do you have some free time to help me with the project? So much for the sabbatical as people are coming out of the woodworks and saying, please, please, please work for me. And then it got more interesting. I started getting these opportunities to get up in keynote and conferences. Like there's this big SEO conference in, oh, hi guys. Um, so I got that. And I also, um, in, in November, we're going to, or excuse me, October, we're going to go to Thailand 
and speak internationally, you know, about the travels and the journeys and things like that going. So all of these things are coming around saying, maybe it's not quite the sabbatical I thought that it was. Maybe there's a new opportunity that's here. I mean, we're already producing content. We're traveling around the world. We're getting people that are saying, please help us do digital strategy. Is there a way that we can combine this stuff that we have together and actually trade a real live business out of that one? So that became the big challenge. So in the States, we have this uh, phrase known as um, eating your own dog food. I don't know if that translates well for everybody else over here, but it basically means putting your money where your mouth is and doing it and shutting up. So I looked at this new space I found myself in to ask myself the question, is what I'm doing a disruptive startup without any idea that's what it was in place? And so there's several different litmus tests we use, but I'll use the same one I talked about earlier, the three tenets of disruption. Are we going up against a stable existing marketplace? Yes. Travel is a $2 trillion business. Some of you in here in the travel space, and you know, there's a lot of, there's a huge market for money being spent back and forth in travel. So, yep, clearly. Is there, and can I serve the underserviced minority? And that's always the tricky one. But the answer is, yeah, thanks in largely in part to a, a new podcast that dropped last year called Serial, Caught the World by Storm. Suddenly, podcasting is less about the boring, horrible, terrible things that are going out there and more about the storytelling, interesting, isn't this really fascinating stuff. And there wasn't a lot of podcasters that were able to actually produce that sort of content. Well, I'm a pretty decent storyteller. And we had been producing that kind of show since the very beginning, and suddenly it was starting to get noticed. And the great news about it, for those again in the travel space, right now travel is all about more and more and more, more content. Beat the other guy producing articles and various things, and, and you'll win the game. Well, great. I write really fucking fast, and I write pretty decent articles. And so I can use the majority to power my minority style of business. Seem like it's going to fit. Can it scale? We're a team of two. I don't know the answer to that question, to be really honest with you. We've only been doing it, I mean, we've been traveling for four months now, as opposed of, of three days ago, and I've only been serious about the business for about a month. So I have no idea if it's scalable, but we're, we are really going to try and give it a shot. We're bootstrapping it along the way, not asking anybody for money. We're, we've, we've got cash, and our, our, that is not our goal, is to raise money. We have a runway. The concept of runway in startups, if you're familiar with that particular term, means the amount of money to go through and keep things going. And right now, we've got runway to get us going at least through the end of the year. Hopefully, we can find a way to actually make it work um, on its own. A lot of people ask me, so are you profitable in what you're actually doing right now? And I say, you're missing the point. Startups that worry about revenue and profits too early wind up missing on gigantic opportunities. That's what you have runway for. It's not about trying to make the money as much and can keep things going as planning and accepting it. Right now, we're in the momentum building phase. Momentum building in that we want more people to see us. That 10% month over month number I talked about, that's the kind of things that we're looking to go to and we're, and we're beating it. So that's, so that's really, really good news. But for us right now, it's really all about momentum and enjoying it and continuing to tell those real compelling stories to the people that are out there. But there is a very, very good chance, 90% I believe I said earlier, that we are going to fail at this startup thing. That at the end of 2015, which is only, what, six months left, seven months left, we're going to wind up with a bank account of zero. And that doesn't freak me out, which is weird, but it really doesn't. And it doesn't freak me out because, like you, I have valuable and marketable skills. And me taking a year off to go travel the world and be exposed to others around the world actually improves my resume. My wife has valuable and marketing skills. As I mentioned earlier, Sheila's a college professor and an instructional designer. So for her traveling around the world, getting exposed to more cultures, is extremely valuable to universities that continue to have a larger and larger international student population, as well as companies that are increasingly going multinational and need someone to create their training information for not just the same people over and over again. This trip is actually good for us even, even, if we fall completely flat on our ass, and that is really cool. The worst thing that happens if, in fact, it fails miserably, we go back and get jobs. We will not wind up living in a van down by the river. We shall not be destitute 
I promise you. Because again, we've got valuable skills. This was a big, big fear of mine for a long time. And why I didn't branch out and do more interesting things earlier because I was convinced that I was going to fall flat on my ass and wind up living on the streets. Unjustified fear, I think. Of course, I've not actually lived on the streets, so I'm going to assume that right now it's all, it's all good, positive stuff. But I want to talk to a little bit, give you guys some takeaways about what does this all mean to you? Great, I'm up here giving you the story, and you're thinking, so what? Where's the SEO? There's no SEO. Spoiler alert. Um, yeah, there's enough about that in the conference. But the idea is I want to give you this is, is five simple things I want you guys to take away from that, from, from, from this, this conversation. I want you to think about this for the future. Number one is you could very well be in a similar situation as I am. On a long enough time scale, whatever you're doing right now to make the majority of your income will not be the thing that you are doing right now to make the majority of your income. On a long enough time scale, everything comes to an end. Now, you may be lucky and keep doing the things that you're doing right now constantly, but I promise you that it will eventually go away. Maybe after you're already done with it and retire, but maybe not. There's a very, very good chance that the rug can be pulled out from under you at any time. Bad shit can happen to anyone, even when you least expect it. So don't think that you're immune because you're not. And no amount of planning you can do will stop the inevitable from happening. You can't stop change from happening. You can't predict all the weird things you can do uh, that, that can happen to you. All you can do is prepare for it and make sure that you're not going to be completely caught un, off guard, although in all honesty, you probably will be. There's not a lot you can do. But the good news, with that little depressing note, is that you are you. And because of the things that you do, because you're here, because of the job that you do, you're not only awesome, but you have valuable skills yourselves. And even if your tactics dry up, even if that little trick that you've got that is working right now, that keeping your clients happy or keeping your side on top and keeping the revenue coming in, even if it goes away, no worries, because it's really more about the strategies that you utilized to either come up with those tactics or to implement those tactics that you learned from somebody else to your unique situation. That's the valuable part. So even if they go away and no other tactic works and you can no longer maintain that ranking, that sales, whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's your brain that's the valuable part. Because you get this thing called digital media and you found a way to implement, this, this, well, some of these tactics, not all these tactics. Is Joe still in the room? Because, man. Um, is, because you can do that, that's what makes you valuable to yourself for the next project, for the next company you want to work with. You can make it. You also don't need to fear living in a van down by the river nearly as much as I was. Your third takeaway is that it really doesn't take as much, and in this case, money, as you think. Right now, when you're all sitting and you're thinking about this, wow, what would happen if I had to go through and reinvent myself completely? It's a little frightening. It's a little scary to think about that, launching your nukes project, whatever. And if you're anything like me, you were thinking about how much money you might need to do that, and you're probably a little worried because you weren't very good at saving. I'm terrible at saving. But the reality is, this is costing us. This craziness, which I'm not recommending you do. I mean, if you guys want to quit your jobs and come join me, awesome. But nonetheless, that's not my, my, my idea here. But this little jaunt that we're doing, I'll be very transparent about it. The amount of money we have saved to do this, are you ready? And not, not saved, the amount of money that's in the bank account that we're spending. Because we didn't dip into our 401k and savings account. We're not, we're not that stupid. Let's not be really, really idiots. Um, 20 grand. That's it. A life on the road living for... 20 grand, which sounds ridiculously cheap, um, and I can get into why, but then I'd be up here for two hours talking about how we actually make that thing happen. But my message to you is that it's not as bad as you think it is. In fact, there was a study that was done about two years ago from people who were facing the worst, people who knew that in front of them they had a, a spouse, for example, um, who was terminally ill and within the next five years would, was, was going to die, like within six months or so. Um, they pulled people who were facing giant layoffs. You know, they were at a company that they knew six months from now this is going to happen and there's a greater than 90% chance that I'm going to go away. Even interviewed people who had been sentenced to prison. 
And they asked them the same question. And it was basically, how much is your life going to suck in five years after that thing, that horrible event has actually happened? And, and of course, they all rated it, you know, sounds pretty shitty when those three things happen to you. And then they went to those exact same people five years later, after that big event, and they asked them again, except this time in reality, how much does your life sucked, especially compared to where it was before? And universally, the answer was about here. So it wasn't as bad. It's not nearly as bad as we project and we assume that it's going to be when we make these unfortunate things that we can't control. It's not that big of a deal. It's a big deal, but it's not as bad as it is. And in our case, it certainly didn't take as much money as we thought that it would. Another takeaway is networks. Networks of people, support groups, friends, and everything else that makes up the people that support you in life. When you're forced, not necessarily choose, but when you're forced off the deep end, into the woods, pick a metaphor, your friends come out in droves to help. Something that we have found, something that as we've been associating with other people that are in, in similar situations to us, they have all found, universally, this is reported, that there's a group of people out there that will support you. And they may not, you know, reach out with open checkbooks and <laughs> those sorts of things. I'm not talking about that. But they will definitely jump in and help where they can by opening up doors, making introductions, finding new ways that they can assist you through the process. And we're not, I'm not just talking about your existing network of friends. I'm talking about the friends you meet along the way. We have created a wide new network of people that we'd never met before we left home in January that are in similar situations and now we're friends with. Or just people we've met along the way who live in the same spots that we've been hanging out for three or four weeks and they've become our friends. I don't know if it's because we've got a fun story to tell, uh, but they've really, truly helped us out along the way. It's been an amazing journey. Don't underestimate the power of your network and also try not to piss all of your friends off. I only pissed a few of them off, so the good news is you can, you can keep them on your side. They'll be happier with you too. And the last bit of it is you know, it's tough. We get into a mindset of wanting more and more and more. We want to keep climbing up to the next big rung and get to the next level, whether it's a job that we have, whether it's an independent consultant that we have, whether it's the next big thing. And there's always this ladder, the very clear path going up. Sometimes that ladder sucks, man. Sometimes that ladder is not worth it. I would suggest occasionally kicking a window and wander around those floors and see what's happening. Jump off the ladder, grab a balloon, do something else. There are alternate paths. There are other ladders, for Christ's sakes. Crawl down off of that one and crawl up another one. There are all sorts of ways. There's no one right path. There's no one right way. You need to go and explore and find out what the future actually holds for you. That's what we did. We didn't plan on it. It certainly wasn't intentional by any stretch of the imagination. But, uh, but it worked pretty well. We've been doing it for about four months now. Having a blast doing it. And uh, honestly, wouldn't, wouldn't change it for the world, even if that meant me getting you know, a big fat paycheck once again. That's the way that works. So I encourage you that when you find yourself in this situation, not if you find yourself in this situation, don't sweat it. Because because you are you, you'll be fine. Thanks very much. So I know that was a really weird talk and probably not what you guys were expecting. And so, you know, your standard questions of how do I rank number one on Google? Um, well, you wouldn't ask those questions. You guys only do that. It's not there. But Craig is in the back. If you do have questions, I'm happy to answer anything that you guys want to ask me about. If there was like a, why did you do this? What are you looking for? Raise a hand and I'll point at you and I'll, and I'll try my best not to give you a complete and total bullshit answer. Uh, honesty is the best policy, I say. Any?